Okay, guys, let's get started again. That includes you, Walter. Okay, uh, next presentation by Christy, uh, an ex Amazonian who I'm trying to talk into coming back, <laughs> um, about the debugger that he's worked on that supports D as well as C and other languages. So. Well, honestly, I'm not exactly sure what I'm doing at a D developers conference since I'm a C++ developer myself. And uh, as a C++ developer, I got annoyed with GDB some three, four years ago, and I decided to roll my own debugger just to see how hard it would be. And, um, you know, it's taken a life of, of its own. It started as a pet project, which I called Zero, to illustrate the fact that that's how much I know about debuggers, Zero. And uh, I thought it it was also a catchy name for, you know, zero, zeroing in into the bugs. Um, so I think a year ago or a few months ago, uh, uh, Andre and Walter uh, suggested that I add uh, D support, support for the D language to this debugger. And um, I wanted to start with a demo, and I'm not sure how well this is going to work because we're running remote over um, X. Uh, this application actually runs uh, on a Debian box back at Brad's home. Um, and this is how the debugger looks today. And uh, <clears throat> what we mostly do with debuggers is step forward, set a breakpoint, you know, step some more, look at the variables, and uh, that kind of stuff. Um, recently, uh, a UK-based company called Undo Software uh, came up with a technology to uh, uh, go backwards in a debugger. And this has been done before with Java. Um, it's easier to do if you have a, a virtual machine. It's much more difficult for compiled languages. And I wanted to show you how I'm integrating. Um, we have a non-disclosure agreement. Their technology is ultra-secret, under ultra-secret probation type of thing. And, uh, um, I have an NDA with, they, with them and we're trying to develop. If you go to their site, they have a demo uh, that works with GDB. I think it's, it works for 30 days, so you can check it out at uh, undo-software.com. And you see here there's a second toolbar with all the things to go backwards. Again, this way may go a little slow, but eventually it'll go backwards. And the advantage is that it restores the uh, complete state of the program variables and whatnot. So if you have a crash and you run from under the deb debugger, you can step backwards and say, how did I get here? So um, can you see it all right? You can go back one instruction. You go the the. the state? You get the. Uh, that's why I switched to registers because you get the. Uh, st you go back to the to the exact state, uh, with the caveat of uh, sending things over the network or doing file I/O. Okay, but as far as the processor and the variables are concerned, you get the same state. So uh, you can probably see the values of the registers changing. So this is just a demo to see what, what kind of technology uh, is available today and to make it a you know, selling point for integrating this with D. So as someone once said, the future, the future is here. It's just not evenly distributed yet. <laughs> so I'm going to switch to my presentation now. Uh, how do I go on presentation mode with this? So I gave this talk, um, variations of this talk, um, in different, uh, uh, for different audiences. And why I'd expect, why, what, what I expect developers to think when they come in and, and listen to this kind of stuff is, uh, well, that's very cool and all that. You develop a debugger, working on it, whatever. But what's in it for me? Why should I be listening to um, something that's uh, 
more heavy on, on, on the system side, you know, explaining how debuggers work and all that. Um, and to preempt that, I used to start with, on my first slide, saying like, well, you know, operating systems and, and software in an ideal world should feel like they're not there. You should not feel the software is there. It should be painless and seamless. Unfortunately, we're in the real world where software has um, idiosyncrasies, and if you understand that, and if you understand how things work, then you can maximize uh, what you get of, uh, of your tools. Um, but the audience today is different in the sense that you guys are not just users of the D language. You shape the D language by sending feedback back to Walter, by doing all the interesting things like uh, PyD and, and uh, you know, stretching, pushing the envelope, really. So I think it's appropriate to talk here about what uh, the technology uh, has available and what are the limitations um, so that we can work together on getting, on getting the entire ecosystem better. Uh, just having a compiler is not good enough. We saw an uh, excellent talk about uh, build system and we, need, we definitely need that. We, we need a source repository, we need a build system, we need debuggers, and we need the entire ecosystem. So um, I think this is a good foundation to start with. Take this thing that I'm developing and add to it. And like I said, I'm not a D expert, but I hope that uh, feedback will help me uh, add those features. And Linux needs a new generation of tools, and D uh, can be, the, can be uh, sparing that effort. Tools today um, have still, uh, you know, things to be desired. Um, I think the, the philosophy of open source today is broken in the sense that um, all of the major projects take like GD, GDB for example. The approach is here are 20 millions of lines of code. Enjoy your freedom. You know, not much to work with. and, and uh, I suggest that, that designs that are based on APIs where we say, you know, it doesn't matter how this is coded inside. This is what the protocol is and, uh, you know, let's just agree what the, what the uh, APIs are and, and start from there. And so for the uh, uh, agenda today, I would like to uh, briefly present uh, what are the building blocks, what the uh, Linux operating system has to offer. Uh, in terms of support for debugging. Um, talk a little bit about the debug information. That is essential because it's where the compiler and the debugger meet. That's the uh, protocol. Um, so it's very important to um, have a meaningful conversation there for the, for the compiler to be able to generate information the debugger can use. Um, there are a few challenges with debugging multi-threaded programs. Um, there are limitations that stem from the way the operating system works. Um, towards the end, um, I'd like to present um, a few ways of, of uh, advanced debugger usage um, and uh, obviously talk. I, I had to add, a, to add a couple of slides about D, right? Couldn't do without since I'm talking here. And then we'll do question and answers. Uh, you can also interrupt me if, if you have questions. Sounds good. So the building blocks um, in Linux for debugging are extremely simple. It's the signal interprocess communications, the ptrace call, the wait call, and the proc file system. That's it. And signals are very old. They they started with the very uh, with the first versions of Unix. They were introduced in order for a process to kill another process, for a process to stop another process, and then they expanded on that. So today, if a process accesses memory where it's not supposed to. That's a signal, it's the segmentation fault signal. On architectures where data has to be aligned to multiple of their lengths, it's not the, it's not the case with the Intel processors, but there are other processors that have this requirement that data access must be aligned. And if you do an unaligned access, you, uh, the operating system will translate the hardware exception into a bus signal, so a signal again. Um, 
If you're trying to execute code that is not valid, it's not a valid uh, opcode, you will get an invalid instruction signal. So, in other words, all these events uh, translate into signals, and this is what uh, uh, debuggers leveraged, uh, using signals uh, uh, to spot events, um, illegal operations, illegal memory accesses, and so on. Um, and so, um, the ptrace call is the workhorse uh, of a debugger. So back in school, they used to say uh, one function should do one thing and do it well. I'm not exactly sure at what school the guy who designed ptrace went. <laughs> because ptrace does a whole lot of stuff depending on the parameters you give to it, but it doesn't do enough. That's why you still have to go to the proc file system to find useful bits. Um, and I think the major sin that ptrace has is it cannot stop the execution of a program in a, synchronous, in a synchronous manner. The debugger has to resort to sending a SIG stop um, to the program it, it is debugging. And of course, in Unix, delivery of signals is asynchronous. So what, the, what this entails is that, OK, I'm a de debugger debugging a bazillion threads. I want to stop. Well, guess what? By the time the program stops, the state has changed a little bit because, you know, it's asynchronous. So we also have to resort to the uh, proc file system to get other, other things like the command line and other bits that are not um, accessible. Now, it depends. Your mileage varies because if you go outside of the Linux world and you go to FreeBSD or Solaris, then um, you may be able to do a whole lot of stuff just with the proc file system itself. Um, Richard Gabriel, who had some uh, interesting essays in the 90s, uh, had this thing, the, the race of worse is better. Anyone familiar with it? So he is explaining why uh, he takes Unix and compares it with an operating system developed at MIT. And he says, this is interesting. It is more important for the implementation to be simpler than the interface. It's kind of the other way around, right? You would expect that the interface should be simple and hide all the complexity in the, in the implementation. And he uses this example with the interrupted system call. If you have an interrupted system call in Unix, it is you, the client, the developer, who has to be aware of that and do a while loop and retry and restart the system call, where, whereas another operating system is done seamlessly. But the design complicates the operating system, and so his entire point is they did this because they were pragmatic and they wanted to get Unix out the door now rather than 20 years later. Um, so debugging uh, or debugger support um, uh, bears the, the consequences of the, same, of the same philosophy because the building blocks are so simple, you have to do a lot as a debugger implementation. For example, in Windows, you have structures that describe debugging events. They tell you, straightforward, you hit the breakpoint, and that's why you're getting this notification. Um, in Unix, you get a SIG trap, and the debugger has to go out and figure, well, why did I get a trap? Is it because I'm single stepping? Is it because I hit the breakpoint? I have to maintain my list of breakpoints, and so on and so forth. So that's work. That means extra work for the uh, debugger implementation. So all these signals, after this work is done, get translated on some sort of some sort of event, and that's what the debugger does essentially. It's a big it's a big event loop. It waits for something interesting to happen in the in the target, and um, the user to interact with it somehow, and then resume the resume the program. And it can be resumed in three ways mainly with ptrace. It can be resumed, uh, go ahead and run until something interesting like a signal happens, or go ahead until whatever comes first, the system call or a signal happens, or just go and execute one machine call. Um, and the sanest way of dealing with multi-threaded programs is to stop everybody upon receipt of an event because then you have a sane view of the world. So now, the simplest way of handling an event 
is to log something and write it into a file, like strace does, for example. Um, but in an interact interactive debugger, you want to look at the stack trace, you want to look at the variables, all that stuff we just saw in the uh, demo. And these are not necessarily listed in the easiness to get to, it, to them. The easiest thing you can, you can uh, get is the state of the CPU, because that's in the user struct, it's easy to get. Not much hel helpful for us who do C++, uh, I mean D. <laughs> not much helpful to uh, just see the, the state of the CPU, you want to do more stuff, like see a call stack. And so you can get, you, the, D, uh, the, the runtime in D implements the same convention in C, am I right, as far as unwinding the stack trace? Yeah, so out of uh, the frame pointer, the program counter, and the stack pointer, you can work out a, st a stack trace unless the frame pointer has been optimized. Do you optimize the frame pointer? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, w with C++ you can work around even this situation because uh, you, can use the, uh, you can use the information that's there for uh, unwinding in the event an exception is being thrown. And even if you don't have the frame pointer, you can get that information. So maybe we can work out something to have the same behavior in D. Um, so even, when, even after you work the stack trace, you just have a list of numbers, a list of addresses. You, you want to translate that to the functions they correspond to, and that's when it started getting complicated because you need symbol information. So you can get symbol information from the executable and linkable uh, format symbol tables uh, that can be static or dynamic. Um, modern programs may use a lot of modules, a lot of uh, share objects, and they can load them and unload them as needed, and the debugger needs to track that. And so you can get a state of what's loaded in memory from the proc file system. So if you go under proc, under each process ID, there is a file called maps that looks like this. It's human readable and shows you what uh, shared objects are loaded at what address, so that given an address, you do a binary search through this map, you find what's the shared object it corresponds to, and then take that and read its symbol table and find, uh, pinpoint the address exactly. And to track the loading and unloading, um, the technique that it's used today is, is um, there is a special breakpoint um, where the debugger needs to, uh, need, uh, the de de debugger needs to observe um, and you will get, that breakpoint will be hit any time the dynamic loader uh, maps and unmaps uh, modules. So by tracking that, you're sure to stay current. But you need to do more than that. You need to do uh, line information and to see the variables and uh, all that good stuff. So for that, you need more. And that, that information comes from the uh, uh, debug information which is generated by the compiler at compile time um, for the later use of, of uh, by the debugger. And um, the good thing about it is that, that it normally stays in a section that's swapped out on disk. It doesn't get loaded when the executable gets loaded. So you have no cost uh, unless you debug it. Um, common formats, uh, stab, but that's being um, slowly deprecate, deprecated because it didn't support uh, it, it didn't support C++ well and doesn't support large-scale programs. So Dwarf is what mo modern C++ compilers output um, on Unix, and it's also what the D compiler um, outputs. So that's where we get, um, that's how we figure out what line uh, corresponds to a given address. We uh, query this um, Dwarf information. The Dwarf format is mostly mostly language agnostic, meaning that the people who designed it started with the knowledge of all the languages they uh, surveyed, I guess, at the time they, they sat down to design this. So they support C++ and support Pascal and Fortran and whatnot. Um, D has some built-in types that, uh, unfortunately, are not covered by Dwarf, and we have to work to extend that. 
the more complex your application is, the more debug information will generate. So fine tuning that is important to, to help the debugger respond quickly. <clears throat> so, so far, um, from all that I said so far, um, we can identify what the, uh, what the architectural blocks are. So there is a main event loop that controls the execution of the, of the debugger. We have thread management to detect them and attach to them, all the symbol table stuff. We need to, to manage the breakpoints because uh, the operating system has no knowledge about that. It will just give us a SIG trap, so we need to manage breakpoints ourselves. We need to uh, have modules that understand debug information. So all of these in my current implementation um, are separate modules that plug in at runtime. You can load them and unload them. The main event loop is the main engine, and everything else uh, pretty much plugs in. Um, this has an advantage uh, that, um, several advantages. So at runtime, you can discard modules you don't need. Um, if I were to do a real debug session at the beginning, I could just jettison the uh, uh, X interface and fall back to the command line because the connection was so slow and just the command line to uh, uh, troubleshoot fast. It is also useful to have some sort of expression interpreter where you say what's the value of variable foo plus two divided by 45. Um, right now the expression evaluator that I have uh, is very C++ centric. Um, so that's another thing that needs to be changed in order to support D. Um, it is also useful to have scripting support to automate, um, to automate debugging tasks to say load this program and after you load it go to line 43, run that loop a thousand times and then dump all the variables so you don't have to step through the code a thousand times. So the way I solved this problem was by embed embedding uh, Python. And I export to Python using Boost Python. Um, I export all the uh, artifacts like uh, thread, engine, uh, breakpoint, symbol table, whatnot. And they are exported as um, non-constructible objects. <coughs> since they're pure interfaces. So like I said, uh, there are, yes? Um, I think that's possible. I, I haven't studied the details. So basically, when I, when I designed this thing, I, I designed it with, uh, op, with the idea to have an object model that is public, you know, an SDK, if you want, of all these abstract classes. So you can use it even if you don't, you don't have to look at the source code, but you can extend this whole thing by adding, by adding plugins. Uh, and implement those interfaces. And the way it works is that once an event happens, the engine broadcasts uh, this event to all of the plugins. And uh, if one of them wants to handle it exclusively, then it just eats the event and nobody else sees it. And that's how the user interface is being implemented, right? Because it grabs the event and then it starts the, the, the dialogue with the user. And after doing this, this for, for a couple of years, I realized that um, nobody writes extensions for it because uh, C++ has an awful learning curve, right? And then once I, once I started doing the Python thing, I realized that you can write extensions in Python. You have just one plugin that, like all the others, receives the notification but translates it into, uh, into uh, Python callbacks, right? So it's a long way of saying that, yes, you can have a Python take over the, in, of, uh, a module written in Python, take over the interaction with the user, and then kick off some expression interpreter off to the side. Because you don't need, when you do expression interpretation inside of the debugger, you, 
you don't need uh, uh, too much of performance. So, yes, but it requires work. So the system has limitations. Like I said, stopping with six top is pretty uh, kludgy. Uh, also, there is a thread affinity restriction. Uh, there can be only one debugger. One debugger can attach to several processes, but only one debugger at a time can be attached to a process. And it's only that thread, even if your debugger is multi-threaded to take advantage of you know, multi-cores and whatnot, uh, it's only the thread that did the initial uh, attach that can do subsequent, subsequent queries. To, uh, and uh, this is really a pain, because if you do, if you do something that like, uh, has a UI like I did, uh, the UI cannot directly uh, do ptrace calls and, and query the, the target. You have uh, the, the main thread has to have uh, some sort of an active object that, that sits in a loop there and uh, uh, receives messages receives messages and executes something on behalf of the other thread and then uh, packages the results and send it, sends it back. So like I said, the easiest way with multi-threads is to stop everybody because um, if you have threads that wait on each other and, and um, you stop, you stop only the one that got, that got some interesting event happening and every, everybody else is running. Um, you can screw the synchronization or uh, you can try to set the breakpoint, but threads share the, the text code, the, the executable code. So you're trying to poke a breakpoint here, but the other thread is running and it hits it and it dies. And so the simplest way to do it is just to uh, stop everybody. But this works fine if you're debugging two or three th threads. If you're debugging 100 or, or 10,000, then you have a linear complexity problem. So this is another limitation. Um, the thread idea as returned by pthread create is not the one that the debugger has to deal with. The debugger has to deal with the thread as it's known to the operating system. And in Linux, uh, this is relatively easy uh, because there is a one-to-one -one mapping. Threads maintain uh, their identity as they cross uh, into uh, kernel space. On other operating systems like FreeBSD, those things are separate. There is a poll of threads running at, in kernel mode that service user threads, and there's an entity called a, a, a scheduling entity, KSC. I forgot what the acronym stands for, but um, it's more difficult to, um, to figure out what the, what the identity is known by the OS for a given user, user thread is. So it's easier in Linux. Uh, I already talked about the affinity worked around. Um, I said in the introduction that it's important to know your tools. Uh, one application I tried to build for this thing was to debug memory. Because at that time, I think Valgrind was either not available or I was just ignorant of it. Um, so I was trying to use the debugger to automate, to automatically set breakpoints at malloc and friends and to uh, track uh, heap allocation and then, and then check for uh, uh, leaks. But that slows down the, the program considerably because every time, every time the target stops, there is a context switch and it goes to the kernel and goes back to the debugger. So that's awfully slow. Uh, knowing that limitation suggests that Valgrind is a better tool for debugging memory problems. Um, Promise to show you advanced usage. Um, you can use the debugger to, te to test patches, um, simple patches, uh, without having to recompile the code. If you suspect, for example, that a bug happens because of uninitialized variables, um, you can use the side effect of evaluating expressions uh, to initialize that variable and test your theory without having to recompile the code. Um, the debugger can be controlled by um, Python scripts, like I said. And um, in a different version of this talk, I had a slide here that was using, uh, that was using uh, uh, this technology to turn the debugger into a, into a test harness. Um, I changed it with this slide because uh, Andre was testing, was doing some D development, and he wanted to see if uh, my debugger works. And uh, he said, wait a minute, I do unit tests, and this thing zooms past them, it stops at main, but that's 
that's too late because the unit test tests when enabled in the run before main. Can you add a feature, please, to have this thing stop at the unit tests? So I was like, mm, yeah, I don't want to hard code that, that thing in. So I came up with, uh, with a script here. Uh, I said that interesting events uh, in the plugins translate into Python. Uh, the on table done is a standard callback uh, that fires uh, once a module has completely loaded. Um, and Python gets the, the symbol table object. So what I can do um, is from the symbol table to get the process on the modules it, it corresponds to, uh, query what the uh, programming la language in, in which that module was written, and it, if it's D, um, knowing what the naming scheme for the unit tests is, I can have it automatically set breakpoints there. So this happens once you're loaded, which is before main, and uh, you get to stop at the unit tests automatically. Um, notice here that in order to set a breakpoint, uh, I have the unit test name with the complete uh, return type. Uh, that's because uh, the DD mangler, uh, generously contributed by Thomas, uh, debugs, uh, demangles um, D names with their complete signature, uh, with the return type and the parameter types. So uh, uh, maybe we can get a way to pass in a flag that says, just give me the, the name of the function. Would that be hard? No. And uh, by the way, integrating, integrating uh, the DD mangler uh, took me about 10 minutes. Because it, because it has a very clean interface. It just has one function. It's called the mangle. You give it a car star. Uh, you know, like I was saying in the beginning, uh, good interfaces are, are extremely important. So thank you. Um, we have added support for uh, uh, dynamic arrays. Uh, this is a type that's not uh, known to other languages like C++, and therefore the dwarf format doesn't know about it. So we had to. Um, extend things a little bit to support this. And then we have associative arrays that are somewhat supported now in the sense that I haven't done. Um, there is some work to, uh, that basically would duplicate what the uh, runtime does right now with all the hashing and all the. Um, so I'm a little bit lazy. I'm not. I was thinking of a way of, of calling directly into the runtime to to figure out where the elements of the associatives are, uh, associative arrays are in memory. Yeah. Yes, that's, exa that's exactly the, the idea. Yeah. So right now it will show you nicely how many elements are in there, but it will not, uh, it will not show you the elements. Um, another problem that I had was, uh, so in order to know if you want to stop at main or at underscore D main, you have to, it's, it's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem. You need to know beforehand if, the, if you're dealing with decode. And I tried to make the, the debugger uh, automatically Automatically inspect the, all of the translation units and figure out which ones which ones are compiled in D, but that messes up performance when I'm dealing with non-decode, and because anyway the the way the tool is set up is that is wrap is the same the same philosophy as with uh, Firefox. You have a script that then starts the real executable. It's easier to set an environment variable in the script if this is what you're doing. If, if you're just debugging D, you can set, enable the, enable the D support and, and be done with it and uh, not have the debugger guess. And then it will automatically stop at D main rather than main and do all that good stuff. So uh, this is it. Yes. Uh, it's also not implemented yet. It can be implemented. In order to implement it, um, I need to write a module that acts as a proxy. Well, a module that acts on the proxy on the client side, another one that acts as a server. So the, it's just work. It's, I, I know how to do it. I just didn't have the time to do it. 
but it, it's also irrelevant as far as support for D goes because if you have it, it will work remotely as well as locally. Mm -hmm. uh, we can, uh, but do you want to do it? Oh, you have the debugger right there? Or? Oh, well, so the code actually doesn't run here. It's on a remote server, but we can do this. Do you want to do it offline or tomorrow I can bring? Uh, yeah, actually, this is the exact type of feedback that, that I like to see. I like to get snippets of, of code that do weird things and then run into the debugger and see how well or not so well they behave and then uh, fix it. So maybe we can do a hands-on session tomorrow, maybe. You are? Oh, excellent. Uh, it works on some programs. There's, a, there's some weird behavior in other cases because we still haven't uh, completely flushed out the... Walter has uh, so many things on his list, so uh, working on how the debug information is being out is not a top priority, so I'm blaming it on him. But, uh, <laughs> but that part of the back end is not, it's not the most fun either, so it's completely understandable. So yeah, it, it works, but expect, expect sometimes weird behavior like the, the cursor to jump at the wrong line, you know. Uh, support, yes. Uh, the support for uh, FreeBSD is only stopped out right now. It's again a matter of time. Um, it's implemented using the bridge design pattern because you have on one, you have uh, the CPU and then you have the OS. And these are two things that vary independently. So it's, a best, it's an excellent candidate for implementing, for using the bridge um, design pattern. And the design is there to support it. It's just that uh, the FreeBSD stuff is stopped out. And on Linux, it supports the uh, 386 and the MD64. Um, I plan to look into the PowerPC as well, and in, yeah, and FreeBSD. But it's not a, it's not a priority right now. Uh, right now, I'm working on integrating the undo stuff and uh, adding support for D. That's the top stuff. Yes. As as good as any other. Uh, it, trapping segfaults is really simple because the hardware translates it into a, into a signal. It's, yeah. And, and that's independent of the language. Integration in other tools, oh. like Eclipse. Uh, yeah. Uh, the, Yes, I, I looked into Eclipse, and uh, the amount of Java code that you have to write uh, is, yeah. So I decided to come up. Yeah, but you have to have you have to implement a bunch of Java code that then does native implementation that calls into my C++ code, something like that. I was just going, yeah, you just stole my thunder there because that's, that's um, I, and actually I'm implementing that in Python. Uh, GDB uses something called DMI, uh, Debugger Machine Interface, uh, which is an alternate uh, command line. It's a different protocol that is more readable by machine than by the human, and this is what Eclipse is using, and I believe DDD. And, yes, and uh, that is a standard available. There, it's a very low traffic uh, mailing list, but I've been monitoring it, and I'm implementing that in Python, actually. So, yeah. so I don't have to write the Java code. Yeah. 
Uh, I don't know, but what do you have in mind? Which? Yeah, no, uh, I don't have that. The only thing that I can say is that uh, I'm not terribly happy right now with performance, and that's something that I'm working on. One feature that GDB doesn't have, and I do have because Andre requested it, is because he got tired of stepping through uh, template code. Like if you have a lot of smart pointers and stuff like that, and you're stepping, you want to do a, a function call, and it does, it goes into all the infrastructure. You can, you can right click and say, uh, don't ever step into this file, or don't ever step into this uh, directory, or don't ever step into this function, and it will jump over it from that point, point on. Well, that's exactly what this feature takes care of because you can say, don't step into these. You, you will just. Yeah, you say you say don't step into this function, or the argument. Well, you step into them the first time, you take that hit the first time, and then once you're there, you say, "Don't come here ever again because this is dead simple and this is not what I'm debugging." And so, you skip it the next time. You can turn it back on. Yeah. Uh, it's possible that the, the thing that's not very well integrated right now is the uh, controlling the UI. Um, like the only the only thing I added is for the integration with Undo, um, which is implemented as a plug-in, and not just because it's clean, but it helps what it helps with all intellectual property issues because their stuff is proprietary. So if I decide to go open source myself or share the code with someone else, I don't have to go and scrub, you know, through a zillion of lines of codes, references to undo. I just take that plugin out. Uh, but I needed to add UI elements, uh, which is that toolbar, the second <coughs> toolbar there, and that's easy to do because you just you just implement something that says add command, goes to all the plugins, and the plugins say, is this for me? And then they do something with it, and they send them a dictionary with things that pertain just to themselves. But adding, doing more complex UI, like entering a dialog and saying, do you want to skip this line of code, requires more form formalization of the interface. Yes. Um, it supports it supports uh, hardware breakpoints on the Intel. Uh, the Intel processor has um, six debug registers, four for addresses, one for control, and one for status. And you can say uh, you can put an address in one of those registers and say when this is hit, you know, fire a breakpoint. And you can do it on data. And you can say you, it has a mask. You can say read or write or both. Uh, and it's multiplexed per thread, right? The, you have these four addresses, but the operating system creates the illusion of having four by thread. And so as long as you don't exhaust them, you can, you can do that. Yes? The quick, thing, the quick answer that comes to mind is to attach a conditional expression to the first breakpoint and have some sort of a global variable, right? So your first breakpoint will, because with, with Python, you can, say, you can set breakpoints. And if you don't give it, you say a thread set breakpoint at address x. And, if, you, and if, you, if, if the address is the only argument, then it breaks into the debugger and you have to interact with it. But you can also give it a second argument, which is a Python-defined function. And it will execute that, and it doesn't have to be interactive. So you can have that function set a global variable to true. Then you have the second 
uh, breakpoint, look at that, and only break into interactive mode if that's set. So that's how the approach it, yeah. All right, thank you.